All right. Good deal. Yes. All right, good deal. Um, so uh, thanks everybody. This is uh, gonna be version two of uh, Market Research 101. Um, Allah asked me to, uh, to put this together about six, seven months ago and um, I uh, had a lot of fun doing it. So this is the second time through. I've, I've added a, uh, quite a bit of new content to it. Um, we're still gonna cover all the old content, but I've added quite a bit of new content for anybody that was uh, in the last presentation. Um, I also put uh, all my contact information over on the left here. Feel free to, to reach out uh, at any time, either email. I know a lot of people after the last one hit me up on LinkedIn and, um, and asked me several questions on LinkedIn and I tried to give them some thorough uh, answers. But now we've got this new UMD Ventures Givitas site. Um, we can use it as well. Um, so feel free to ask your questions there. or um, And also, if you're interested in any of the more in-depth content that I do, I, I have a, a blog here that I tend to put things out on um, periodically. And so I, I called this the, the Not Market Research 101 because I, I did upgrade it, um, but we are gonna cover some of the same uh, content. So the, the last time through this, um, I said that when uh, Allah asked me to do this, I was, I was uh, fairly, uh, it was a daunting exercise because I am not a market research professional at all. Um, I'm an operator. I've, um, I used to work at Microsoft for about 16 years. Um, yeah, started in engineering and moved my way through the sales and marketing and ended up managing a lot of businesses for the company and, and ended my career there. And, and uh, after helping build a worldwide public sector organization uh, and a U.S. public sector organization. Um, and I started my first company um, with a group of other individuals uh, called Point About. And uh, then um, I took over a company called Greenline Systems and we had a great exit. Um, and then I built a new company uh, called uh, NetWatcher. And uh, a few years ago, we sold that to Qualys. Um, and it was a cybersecurity company. And, and so I've, I've had a little bit of experience on the big company side and a little bit of experience on the startup side over the last, uh, say, 30 years. And, and um, hopefully we can share some of it with you here. But I am an operator. I am not a market research specialist by any means. Um, but I hope to provide you with some some insight into uh, what I've learned here. And, and I'll start with um, this uh, little model that I first learned in 2005 off of O'Reilly's website. Um, and it has stuck with me and it is so true that um, ideas, um, the concept where ideas are cheap. Uh, you know, anybody can have um, a great idea, you know, even a brilliant idea, um, but without execution, um, those ideas really go nowhere and they're, they're not worth a whole lot. And, and you can really use this model and you can say, well, if I've got a weak idea and brilliant execution, it, it actually might be worth something, um, quite a bit actually. Um, but if you've got a brilliant idea with brilliant execution, it could, it could really change the world. And, uh, and that's, that's really what it is about. And, and, um, Market research uh, is one of the keys to great execution. And you're gonna hear me repeat that over and over again throughout the course of the next hour um, and probably into the Q&A at the end. Uh, so let's, uh, let's just get into it here. Um, this is a, a new slide and, and you know, I, I said that when Allah first asked me to do this, I felt like it was a daunting exercise. Um, um, however, now, now I've become opinionated um, through the course of uh, the last six months because when I'll ask me to do this, I started listening to um, blogs uh, or listening to podcasts, uh, two of them specifically that I have in the slides at the end, um, about market research. And I started uh, questioning some of the market research um, professionals and really um, from an operator standpoint, um, you know, think some are good and, and some are, are not so good. And, and, and um, you know, one of the things that I read recently is this blog post that I have up here and I, I won't embarrass the blogger by putting it up, uh, by putting up the link to it. But the, um, 
I, I saw it and it, it kind of irritated me a bit. Um, you know, they, the whole concept was that, you know, a good startup, you know, with success is a combination of great leadership, great products, and a lot of luck and good timing. And the more I think about that, the more it, it just irritates me. And, and it really gets to the essence of, of execution and market research. And I mean, it, 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 the, the luck piece of it just is what irritates me. And it's kind of like, you know, centuries ago when, when people thought that, you know, they didn't have a good crop because it wasn't raining, so they had to pray to the rain gods. Um, that's, that's my concept of luck, right? You don't really understand what you have. You don't understand how to take it to market. Um, so you're hoping for good luck. Well, hope is not a strategy and you've probably heard that a thousand times. Um, but you know, luck, uh, does not play a part in the successful company. Um, luck may play a part if, um, you don't, you know, do your job as, um, an entrepreneur and you're just a product person and it's, you know, try to put a product in the market and maybe it takes off, maybe it doesn't. So maybe luck did have something to do with it because um, you didn't do your job in the first place and you just got lucky. Um, but, you know, most people that have success in today's world of startups actually do their job and they they look at the market and they, they actually operate the correct way and, and they do the research. And so, you know, rather than praying to the rain gods, they understand what, you know, rain harvesting looks like and crop rotations look like. And, and they've done the work to figure out, okay, what it takes to actually um, make a good crop happen. And it's the same with startups, right? And that's why, um, you know, great, great luck and timing uh, really play very little of a part in, a, in, in building a company. And so um, I'm going to try to use that theme over and over here, but I'll, I will back up constantly to what the textbook says. Um, and this is the textbook answer for why we do market research. Um, it's essential, basically essentially to know that there's a long-term viable market for a product and, and that there are new ways uh, for a company to maintain a competitive advantage in an ever-changing landscape. And, and that's true. Um, it's textbook. Uh, I think the most important part of it is the ever-changing piece um, because market research is not something to be done at the beginning of a company uh, or when you're putting together a business plan and it's not to be done quarterly and it's not even to be done monthly. It's to be done on a moment by moment basis and it has to be instilled in the DNA of the product and the company from day one. Um, and so, you know, with this textbook definition, I, I accentuated the ever changing piece and I crossed out the new product piece because uh, I think it's it's in a product from start to to finish and and um, and that's why I uh, I updated it a bit there, but I'm going to go do the operator view of this now. Um, why we do market research, which um, probably deviates quite a bit from the uh, textbook definition. Um, and to to do that, I want to start with what with um, you know what a market researcher's job is. There's there's 500,000 market researchers with that title in the United States, right? And Gartner has a bunch, Forrester has a bunch, every large company, Microsoft, GE, they, they all have a bunch of market research folks. Well, what are their jobs, right? Um, their jobs are to um, understand the competitive landscape, um, not just the big guys, um, but also the, the companies that can disrupt them, the, the people that are coming up, um, the startups that have new ways of doing things that, that could disrupt big businesses. Um, they, their job is to understand the customer's current needs and future desires. Um, that means you're out talking to, on the ground talking to customers and, um, and the people that influence customers. Um, you have to understand other segments of the population. Um, that could become customers. This we'll talk a little bit about from a blue ocean perspective, which is in a future slide here. Um, you have to understand the associated business opportunity. You have to understand how to potentially capture um, that business opportunity and then all the risks and risks um, are daunting. They can you know, be everything from market risks to more importantly, legal risks. Um, and I'm uh, doing a project right now where I'm trying to understand uh, the online auction market and the risks are substantial because of years and years of uh, state, local and federal laws around auctioning. And so without understanding those legal risks, you can't really understand 
um, the business opportunity. And so um, getting back to the textbook reason of why we do uh, market research coming from the landscape of what a market researcher's job is, um, is to predict the future. Uh, no, not really. That's, I was being facetious there. It's really so we can make better decisions. And, and that's really at the end of the day, what the, um, the, uh, that's how we take uh, the luck part out of this is if we do our job and understand uh, the landscape, we can make better decisions. Um, but it, it's difficult. And one of the reasons uh, a lot of startups fail to do it is because they are started by people that lack the experience in many of these, these areas. And, um, and so the areas that you need to have experience in to do a great job of market research um, are technology. Uh, you can't do market research today unless you thoroughly understand uh, machine learning. And um, if you don't understand machine learning, you really can't do a good job of market research. And so any of these groups that, you know, the market research entity is in the marketing organization uh, probably are not going to, you know, do a very good job. Um, and not only that, you have to understand the products and you have to use the products. So, for instance, in cybersecurity, if you're building a cybersecurity company today, you, you better understand the competitive products in you know, know what it means to use them um, and even support them uh, to, to many degrees in order to understand um, how to give a of what's happening in the marketplace and be able to, to make better decisions around it. You actually have to understand the user interface design and, and more importantly, um, the, the UX side of it, the experience design. Um, you have to understand marketing from, a, you know, uh, an SEO perspective, an SEM perspective, it's pay-per-click, uh, content marketing, you got to understand video marketing, um, you know, the, the ways that people are gaining content today, a great deal of it is coming from YouTube. And if you don't understand the nuances of, of how um, the YouTube audience is built and, and how that works and the psychology behind it, more importantly, uh, about how habits are formed, how dopamine, serotonin, and adrenaline really uh, drive the marketing piece of it. Um, uh, loss aversion, priming, the, these are concepts that you, you have to have a good grasp of in order to do this. And then, you know, obviously business, you have to understand macroeconomics versus microeconomics and supply and demand. Um, and so market research is a very difficult job at the end of the day, and one that requires a great deal of experience. And and one that if you don't have the experience, you have to find people that you trust that can help you in each one of these areas um, to help you build bridges to um, the decision, the, the uh, methodologies you need to put together to do it. Um, and so with that, I'll go back to the textbook. Um, you know, I'll go away from the operator's view and get back to the textbook, which is really what is market research? And this is another one of those sentences where I just gloss over and um, say, yeah, uh, it's continuous systematic process of collecting and analyzing, interpreting information, blah, 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 blah. But when you step back and look at this, it's if you write source code, you'll you understand that there's bad source code, there's loose source code, and then there's really tight, efficient source code. Well, this is one of those sentences that is really tight and efficient. Um, and I have a lot of respect for this sentence um, because of how much information about market research um, they've packed in here. It is continuous. So if you take one thing away from this presentation, it is, um, you know, I've said it already and I'll say it again and I'll say it before the end. Um, Market research has to go on every single moment of the company's existence, and it is continuous, and that's more important now than ever before. And um, and it is also systematic. And um, today we we don't build widget companies; um, we build data companies. And so, data is the new oil. Uh, I know that's an overused phrase, but it unfortunately is. Um, or fortunately is for folks like me that love technology. Um, but getting that data, if you're not um, systematic at collecting it and looking at it and analyzing it, it um, just, um, you know, it, you're not going to have a good experience about building a company. Um, and, you know, 
collecting, analyzing, and interpreting is all about taking data and turning it into information and then turning that information into knowledge. Um, and it is where uh, the data analytics and machine learning can really, really help you out um, in this, in this uh, world. And then target markets. Um, I can't say enough about you know, in the, in the past, 10 years ago, when you ask what vertical you were in, you would say, well, I'm in, you know, healthcare I'm in financial services. Well, today it's about micro markets. And um, it's not even micro markets, it's micro micro markets. Um, you know, you, you hear the word or the term use case thrown around. It's really the use case is the target market. And um, we're going to dig into use cases here in a bit. Um, as well. And so a use case, you know, you think about healthcare. Well, part of healthcare, there's telehealth. You might think that's a micro market. It's not, you know, a, a micro micro market in telehealth um, is, is something, maybe it's telehealth in um, uh, psychology in Japan, right? It's, it's really, you know, getting to the essence of, of how behavior happens within that micro market that's, that's the most important piece and where success will start to come from. And it's about uh, understanding the consumers and also the competitors. And then I will add one as an operator onto this, um, the supply chain. Um, you will learn more about how uh, business works by analyzing a company's supply chain than anything else um, and how the supply chain works. And so I, I, I'm not sure why they forgot that, but I'm going to add it in here as well. And then in the upper right-hand corner here, you'll see that um, you'll see this on several slides. Uh, it's really from the Lean Startup World, and um, you know, if you haven't read the Lean Startup book, uh, you should, or get one of Steve Blank's books that are they're also based on uh, Lean Startup methodologies. Um, you uh, you uh, won't uh, go wrong. That's how companies are built today. And it's all about building, measuring, um, and learning, and then, then iterating. And um, if you want to read a, a great book about this, it's called Scrum. Um, it's uh, one of the, you know, it's basically a, a version of agile software development, but taken to the point where you can actually use it to manage a company. Well, Lean Startup is, is how to do that in the startup world and uh, a, a great book to, to read. So, um, you know, I, the one thing I will say is, is a caveat to this is um, market research does change uh, based on where you're at in your company's life cycle. Uh, you know, day one, it's more about the feasibility and testing assumptions. Um, you know, the, the further in you get uh, on the startup, whether or not, you know, you're deep into your, um, 30, 60, 90 day plan, or you're actually uh, raising money. It's, it's mostly about the lean startup methodology about building, measuring, learn, which is about creating a, a minimal viable product, getting feedback on it, iterating on it, showing it to your customer base again, and getting feedback on it and pivoting when necessary. If, if you find that you've hit roadblocks, um, if you're not a market leader, say that, you know, you're a competitor in a space and you have 10, 15, 20 other companies that are in that same space, um, but there is a dominant leader. Um, you know, you have to understand uh, where that leader is is weak, and um, you know, you have to be able to search for uncontested space, which is part of this blue ocean strategy approach that we're going to speak to in a second. Um, and then, if you are the market leader, um, you clearly have to understand um, the innovation that might wipe you out um, and take advantage of it and the sentiment of all the folks around you. Um, I will say that the, the delta between a market leader and the three other types that I have on the, the screen here are really important. Um, when you have a leadership position in the market, you actually have to act like a leader. So your behavior as a company has to change. And how you go about competing and researching what goes on out there um, has to change quite a bit. And I've got a slide on this in a second, um, so I won't get into too much of it here. But I, I do want to get into a case study. I used this case study the last time we went through this, and, and uh, I'm going to use it again because I just want to use it to make a point, uh, a couple points, actually. Um, you know, and this is uh, basically uh, the New York taxi world. Um, you know, if you were there, 
in 2009, you went into Manhattan, all you did is see a bunch of these uh, yellow cabs running around. Um, and, uh, you know, back then in 2009, this little company called Uber um, hit the ground in New York and they put a team out there um, to start gathering data, right? And they, they, you know, were looking at everything from the quality of the taxi services to what, you know, it costs to have a medallion to run a taxi, um, what were the um, political implications of that, um, you know, how did universities react to that, did the universities um, find a, a need for something new, um, you know, how did cell phones work in the environment, they, the, the team hit the ground to, and to talk to customers, to talk to the taxi drivers, to talk to politicians, and and really start gathering the microdata. And all the New York taxi company at that point cared about was how was the revenue doing, how were their rides, what were their call volumes, um, and maybe some customer customer um, support. But that that was about it. And uh, this little company nobody ever heard of called Uber was actually going after this really minute data um, on behavior and how how things worked. And and I think that you know. Even though Uber was having a lot of success in other parts of the world, the New York taxi company thought, you know, our politicians will, will keep them out of the market. Um, but, you know, come 2014, the politicians started hearing that the constituents that voted for them um, really wanted this uh, in the environment. And so the um, politicians started listening more to the constituents than they did to the New York City taxi company. and and um, both Lyft and Uber started taking off. And um, what Uber understood was, you know, this is, this is really um, about supply and demand. And if you, if you look at Uber, you know, some people that are novices that don't really understand today's world uh, would say, yeah, they're a ride-sharing company. Um, I think all of us that, that understand that today's world is, is more about data, understand that Uber is really a data analytics uh, company uh, focused on solving logistics problems in the supply and demand world. Um, and, uh, you know, they, they are a data company and a data analytics company at the end of the day. Um, and supply and demand is the driver. And if, and if any of you have ever I interviewed it at uh, Uber, you know that before you can even get to the first interview, face-to-face uh, -face interview with anyone there, you have to take a test um, on supply and demand. And um, that not for the drivers, I'm, I'm talking about for an employee of the company. Um, they really, really thoroughly care about how uh, and whether or not people understand uh, analytics and specifically how uh, supply and demand works and macroeconomics. Um, and you know, you'll find if you study Uber a bit, they, they've built, um, analytics into their product from day one. They can they understand traffic patterns. They understand everything about how um, a market works on the ground because they have so many sensors running around the city. They have you know all these cars um, that have cell phones in them, and the cell phones are connected to the internet um, constantly, and so they're they're collecting data. Uh, minute by second by second and um, they know that their drivers not only uh, drive for uber they drive for other taxi or the other services as well and you know lo and behold uber uses that to collect data on their competitors um, it, it's quite amazing um, how they think about data collection and and um, you know, I, I would uh, suggest you read this little Neil Patel uh, blog post about how Uber uses data. It's quite eye-opening. Um, uh, it'll give you a whole level of respect for this company. Um, and they've, they've done, you know, a yeoman's job of, of building their company. They've, they've got a ton of challenges, but they've, they've done an incredible job. And, you know, just through this COVID-19 uh, pandemic piece, um, if you look at what they've done uh, about shoring up their, their business, um, they've actually moved, you know, they haven't moved, but the market has moved and they made some great decisions about building Uber Eats. Um, that Uber Eats has really saved their company. Um, and a great deal of what they lost, the 75% of their business they lost on riding, ride sharing, um, was picked up on the Uber Eats side of the business. And, um, you know, that allows them a lot of flexibility to take share 
um, away from others like Lyft, um, for example. But, you know, they have to also keep in mind that they need to look at their, you know, the, the research around what their customers are saying and doing. And they should be worried right now from a ride sharing perspective. Uh, the Lyft is, you know, nailing them. Um, people don't like, you know, their experience in Uber as much as they like their experience in Lyft. And um, I'm sure that they're all over this um, because, you know, um, there's a lot of people writing about it. And they also have to listen to their employees. This is something you know, you, you, um, you should do as a good company and, and uh, research, you know, market research is not just what customers say and not what co competitors are, but market research, a great deal of it actually comes from your own employee base uh, about your company and about what they know about the environment as well. And uh, Uber has a little bit of work there to do that I think is um, in the press quite a bit. They're getting better at it. Uh, every day. And uh, the one blind side, um, the one thing that I don't think they've done a great job of, if there's one criticism, um, is, you know, the policy side of it. They're, they're losing ground in places like California, their home state. Um, and uh, that is going to spread to other parts of the world as well. And, um, you know, I watched this go down at Microsoft when I was there with uh, the Department of Justice coming after Microsoft. Um, and the same thing's happening to Uber here. And it, you, you have to respect uh, the policy side of things. And for, so, you know, market research um, has to extend into the legal domain as well and the, the political policy side um, as well. And, uh, and that is uh, fortunate or unfortunate, I don't know, but it, it's just part of the, part of the equation that a market research um, person has to do or you have to do building a company. If you are your uh, CEO and you are the market research person for your startup, um, you, you actually have to be the one to do it. So, all right, I'm gonna back up again. I constantly have to go back to the textbook um, and uh, kind of uh, revisit here the purpose of market research just so I, um, I make sure everybody understands the textbook side of it. Um, you know, obviously it's to determine the feasibility of a business. Um, is there demand for the product? Is there the market uh, large enough? How many entry points? In other words, how many companies are there uh, doing this? Um, I uh, also, you've uh, heard me say a little bit about Blue Ocean Strategy. If you uh, have not read this book, uh, it's 30 years old, but it is a, must read book um, you you uh, have to if you're if running a company you, you have to read this book um, and there's been uh, a lot written uh, you can actually go to SlideShare and uh, pick up a lot of presentations that will go through the, the blue ocean strategy um, this is a consulting firm that the two people that wrote this book uh, have um, they've done a, a really good job of of helping the world understand um, you know, how to think about this. And this is what's called a strategy canvas here. Uh, it's, it's one of the tools in the Blue Ocean Strategy. They, they have, you know, probably 50 tools and this is just one of them. But I think it's one of the most important ones. And um, this actually shows a little bit of um, how to look at the Yellowtail Wine was a, a, a Australian wine company that came in, you know, again, 30 some years ago. Um, when everybody was just drinking these high-end premium wines or these really, you know, uh, low-budget cheap wines. Um, and, um, you know, uh, Yellowtail looked at this market and said, you know, what is everybody competing on, i.e., you know, from a tech perspective, this would be what are the features everybody's marketing? And they said, well, you know, maybe there's three other features here. Um, easy drinking, uh, ease of selection. In other words, we're only going to have red and white and that's it. And they're going to taste really good. Um, and, you know, we're going to market them uh, in a fun way, uh, not a stuffy way like these, these premium wines and not a cheap way like these bargain wines. We're going to have fun, adventurous commercials. And, um, and they, they accentuated those three uh, features, essentially, and they started taking uh, the market. And um, it, it's just a wonderful way to think about uh, the world. And this is another one of their tools where they, they basically said with, with that 
blue ocean approach, um, we're going to go after not just the first tier, which are the people that, yeah, they used to drink um, those uh, horrible tasting premium wines, um, but they never liked them. So we can get those people first. Um, and then we can go after uh, the people that didn't drink wine, they refused to. They were the beer drinkers or the martini drinkers. We can go after them uh, because they like good tasting stuff as well. And then they're like, well, you know, there's this other category of spouses out there that don't drink at all hardly um, because they don't like the taste. And, you know, they might like something sweet. So we can go after all of them. And um, they, they had a strategy to go after the first tier, second tier, and third tier of the market. And they just, what they changed the landscape of the wine business. And that's why, you know, you know, 30, 40 years later, we see Yellowtail wine on, on the shelves every, everywhere. Now, I don't know if they've kept up uh, with um, that approach, but you know, it's, it's how they ended up going uh, in becoming competitive in the market. Um, you also have to understand the trends that are occurring um, and competitive strategies. Um, and throughout this presentation, I'll give these little tips. Uh, I started using this uh, visualping.io uh, site. Uh, basically, it allows me to keep up on any competitive technology that I I want and uh, helps me know when they've changed something on their website. Um, it allows you to hone in on different parts of the website that you're curious about if they ever changed it. Um, and so that's one way to keep, there's hundreds of ways to keep up on your competitors. That's one that I'm using right now that I, I liked. Um, you also have to test for demand. It's another purpose of market research. Um, you know, and uh, you have to ensure product placement. Obviously, this is the typical marketing, how, when, where a product should enter the market. And so that, those, that's the textbook approach to the purpose of market research um, as, as well. And so um, that I'm just going to kind of um, you know, slide into the next part of the presentation, which is, is really uh, how to operationalize um, uh, a great deal of this and, um, and get into, uh, you know, uh, basically how um, you have to think about this from a startup perspective. Because I, I know a great deal of the people that attended the first um, call were interested in this uh, from I have a product that I want to take to market or I have a technology that I want to take to market. So this next half of the presentation is mostly about um, that audience and, and how to do it. Although I do have a couple uh, tips in here for others as well. So let's start with the textbook. What are the types of um, research out there? There's obviously primary and secondary. Um, primary research is, you know, getting firsthand data. This is the chef walking out to uh, their restaurant and um, asking the people in the restaurant uh, table by table what they thought of their dinner. Um, you know, and, and this is, um, you, you, you don't do this to um, uh, get praise. You, you're, you know, you're out there looking for criticism because in criticism, um, you can do something about that. With praise, you know, that's, that's great, it's good to hear. Um, you know, maybe they can put it in their marketing, but you're out looking for criticism. And so primary research is, is just absolutely uh, essential and probably the most important thing you can do um, being a new startup, new, you know, after some good feedback. Uh, secondary information, this is, you know, um, publicly available information. Unfortunately, this is what all your competitors have access to as well. Um, I love uh, the Google Trends site. Um, you know, it's, it's something I've used for years. Here's Uber versus Lyft. Um, I'm doing a lot of research on um, uh, auction sites uh, right now. Um, so I uh, have been, you know, researching live auctioneer versus proxy bid. Uh, dot com because of another project I'm doing um, and just trying to figure out um, some things here. Um, I must have spelled something wrong here. Um, yeah, I did. Um, it's plural. So, uh, you know, you can see how people compete and uh, look it over, you know, uh, the last 90 days, uh, for instance, and, you know, it just gives you all kind of ways to pivot it and figure out, you know, what countries that people are having success in and that, and that type of thing. Uh, I love the tool. Another tool that, you know, you use periodically, I was uh, getting into the uh, housing market, the, the real estate market, and I started using the census site quite a bit. Um, you can do a great deal with uh, this data and you can pivot it a million different ways. 
Uh, unfortunately, the, the current administration has um, taken back some of the real power of uh, some of these tools that the government has provided, but uh, maybe we'll be lucky and we'll have a new administration that, that um, is a little more open. Um, but, you know, that site is a, an incredible site, as long uh, as well as data.gov, uh, even though the, the data has not been kept up to date, is a pretty good uh, source of information. But the secondary sources are only so good that the most important thing is obviously the primary research. And, you know, and, and this speaks to, you know, why um, the founders of Uber put people on the ground um, in the city. Um, that was one of the most important things that they could do. So another textbook slide, um, and then it's basically all operations from uh, this point on. But another textbook slide is there's uh, two types of information: there's qualitative and quantitative. Uh, and, you know, this audience here knows this uh, really well. Um, qualitative one, you know, it's it's more about the feeling. Um, I love anybody that knows me knows I I love this site here from uh, from uh, North Carolina State University. Um, it, where you can put in different things uh, to see what uh, is actually happening on Twitter. So if you uh, you know search on Uber right now, they look at the tweets that are occurring uh, right now in regards to sentiment, for instance. Um, and you can look at pleasant to unpleasant, active to to non-active, and you can actually click on a bunch of them uh, to figure out what the tweet said um, and and get a good sense for you know what what sentiment is on this uh, company or topic. And they've added a bunch of other things like a heat map, a timeline, which is really good to see uh, what changes are, are actually happening um, in the you know, time as well and whether or not people are getting more unhappy or less unhappy. Um, you know, you can, you can use a bunch of that. And so, you know, getting this qualitative how people feel about things, uh, social media for all its uh, problems, um, you know, uh, it has one good thing, which allows you to see um, how people uh, feel about what you're doing. Um, qual quantitative information is more about the statistical data. Um, if uh, you know you watched this presentation before, uh, you know that um, basically uh, uh, I love Statista. Um, it's a it's a great site here where you can search on multiple different things. Um, like here's uh, research on Uber and everything in blue is free. Uh, everything that's not blue is you got to pay for. Um, and uh, it's a great way to get some of this quantitative information. Um, I just found this uh, site here that I've been using quite a bit lately. Uh, I'm not even sure how to pronounce it. K-N-O-E-M-A. Um, and uh, it's a, a great site that allows you to go out and find all kind of free research out there on something and I did a search on on uber and it brought back just a, a ton of information um, and uh, you know this slide deck will be made uh, to, to give the anybody that wants it here um, just uh, all in one you can get it to you but it use that link it, it really is a great way to get some quantitative information um, so I, I will give you one piece of mature company advice um, mature companies have a leg up on, uh, on everybody else in regards to how to collect market research data because they have account managers um, that are deep into the qualitative side. They, they know whether or not their customer is a lag or an innovator, uh, which is really important if you've read the book Crossing the Chasm, which there's a link to here. It's an incredible book. Um, the account managers know if they're happy, uh, if their customer's happy and going to purchase again. They know um, whether or not they're um, uh, what their competitors are doing. Um, the, and from a quantitative perspective, um, they've got employee satisfaction, customer satisfaction, partner satisfaction, they've got resumes. Their HR people know better than anybody whether or not the company's doing a good job um, because they see whether or not you know, more recruits are coming in or less. Uh, but support tickets, support tickets are just a wealth of information because they are the pain. And pain is where the sales process is and you can, the, a market researcher's heaven is um, looking at what is happening in support um, and uh, getting really good at, at you know, building that into the business model um, from an R&D perspective and from a business perspective. And then just utilization of the product. Most products today come in some form of SaaS if they're tech uh, oriented and um, getting 
you know, a thorough understanding of what operations is saying about how people are using the products. Um, obviously, you know, you, you want to be like Uber and build the analytics into every part of this. Um, and, you know, I think you've probably all heard that everyone is in marketing. Um, you know, that's an overused phrase because it is, you know, anybody that picks up the phone that talks to a customer or anybody in the world about your company um, is in marketing, right? And that that's just a, a part of the job. But now I think you, what you, you now hear is everybody's in market research um, because everybody that touches any aspect of um, what you're doing in your company is, is doing research. And, and, you know, that's whether or not they're, they're sales reps or HR people or they're su your support people. Um, so with that, let's get into the stages um, of market research. There's, you know, kind of the four of them. There's exploration specific, what if, and then continual. Um, exploration first. Uh, this is um, step one is to find all those use cases. So, you know, the, the dilemma for most people that come out of the university are, you know, it, it's much easier uh, to have a problem and find a solution that fixes that problem than to have a solution to find a problem. Uh, it's a thousand times harder to find a um, uh, find it the opposite way, right? So, um, but to do it, what you need to do is you, you, uh, you have to uh, uh, really understand the issues, understand the use cases, the industries, that you're viable and, and list those use cases out. Um, you know, your, your technology might be viable in the prison system, for instance, to monitor prisons, but it also might be viable in telehealth. Well, you have to understand that those are two viable use cases, um, but now once we have those use cases, you know, let's understand the markets and the customers and the momentum and all the other things around those. Um, and, uh, and, you know, that, that is market research. Um, and you also have to understand how long it's going to take you to get to an MVP, a minimal viable product, in each one of those use cases. So that's that's just an assumption here. Uh, step two of the exploratory phase is, is to take each one of those use cases and understand the supply and demand. Understand how many sellers there are, how many buyers there are, and how many dollars are spent in the market. Um, based on this. So if you're selling blast furnaces, there's a low amount of sellers, a, high, a low amount of buyers, and there's a lot of money spent. So if you're going to do this, you better have extremely valuable technology uh, that's difficult to replicate uh, or it's not going to go anywhere. But if you're a car manufacturer, you have uh, you know, a low number of sellers, a high number of buyers, a lot of money spent. So you really want to license your technology or OEM at the one of these car manufacturers. Um, but if you're selling fire detectors, there's a higher amount of sellers, high amount of buyers, and a lot of dollars spent. So that's likely a good company. Anybody else, you know, you find if your use case comes up high, low, high, low, 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 it's a waste of time, right? Just don't, don't waste uh, any of your time trying to figure that out. But this is why market research is so important and why people say luck, right? It's, it's not luck. You know, you've done your work, you figured out whether or not there's momentum there, and you deal with it. Um, you also um, can uh, have to prioritize these use cases. So now you know that your product, your technology can be used in these five different ways, um, and you've done your homework there. And uh, you realize that now you've got to prioritize them and you prioritize them on which one has the low amount of entry points into the market. Um, timing, is it timing now or sometime in the future? Is there momentum? Obviously, I use the prison example. Not a lot of momentum in the U.S. prison market, but there's a great deal of momentum in the telehealth market. Um, you know, how buyers want to buy. Uh, do they want to buy through channels or do they want to buy direct um, with the onset of uh, Alibaba and Amazon? On, you know, people want to buy through that channel. Uh, so you need to understand how you're going to leverage that maybe. Um, customer motivation, you know, is, is another important thing. Is are they highly motivated to buy or, you know, do they buy once in a while? Is it a whole bunch of laggards or a bunch of innovators buying? Um, you know, the cost to get to an MVP is also, like I said, really important. And also, uh, you have to go really deep on these. Um, uh, you have to really do the blue ocean approach uh, to this use case and figure out what are the things that you can market on within these use cases to open up uncontested space so you don't have to compete with those that are already competing in that marketplace. Um, who to approach um, to talk to these and, and you know, summarize what you learned and make a go-no-go -no -go decision on that use case. And then 
you know, you're ready to move into the next stage, which is really specific, which is gathering primary data, like we talked about uh, what primary data was before. And there's three steps to it. Um, there's, you know, building the persona, um, which, you know, I love these HubSpot tools here um, to give you a general idea of, you know, what a persona is. These are who's buying, who's influencing um, the purchasing. Uh, there's two great free HubSpot tools there. They, they only take you so far, but they get you started. Um, you know, you have to build the questions. Um, you know, I love the exercise pain, power, vision, value, control. It's what sales essence is. What is the pain? Why do people buy? Who buys? You know, who is the power, the one that writes the check? Uh, what is the vision you're going to paint them for why they need to separate their, with their cash to give you this? Uh, what is the value equation? Is it uh, the value equation political? Is it power? Is it, um, is it return on investment? Um, and then you have to control the sales cycle as well. And uh, when you're building the questions you want to ask people, um, they should be in the context of each one of these things to figure out. Um, and they need to be consistent across your customers as well. Uh, and um, and the question should determine whether or not you're dealing with a laggard or an innovator. And you'll get that once you read Crossing the Chasm, another 30-year-old book. Um, and then step three is you have to go out and just engage people. Um, you know, a minimum of 10, you should get more than that, but you know, you really have to talk to people. Um, that's the most important thing. You have to be that chef that walks in to the, um, to the dining room and starts talking to the people that are uh, their guests. Um, and you want root cause. Um, this is something Microsoft taught me during my time there. We had to go through as managers, we had to go through two classes. One was called precision questioning and another one was called argumentation. Uh, basically, they were teaching us how to debate. Um, and, um, you know, one of the quick and dirty tools is, is something to get at root cause analysis. So you ask why five times. So, um, you know, that's based on my last company of NetWatcher, you know, why did the customer get hacked? Um, there are remote code execution vulnerabilities um, because no one's updating their web frameworks because it takes too much time to apply patches. Uh, why? Because they haven't built the processes and procedures to allow for this. Uh, so this might be the root cause. Uh, it's not, you know, protecting people from getting hacked. It's protecting people from themselves uh, because they're not doing their job. So, you know, you, you need to thoroughly understand the use case at the um, at the lowest level possible and to get really specific uh, on that as well. And, uh, and then you have to determine what info is relevant. You know, there's macro information, um, you know, how big is the market? What are the risks in the market? Uh, what are the sales channels? And then there's a really micro stuff, you know, uh, who's shaping it? What, is the what are their supply chains? What are they selling on? What are their margins? Um, and, you know, if you can, if there's any public companies, um, you need to read all of their annual reports. Um, you know, Edgar is uh, just a brilliant place to go to to get annual reports, K1 or uh, 8Ks, 10Qs, S4s. Um, get everything you can to read on these. It's, it's all out there. It's, in, you know, kind of hard to read sometimes, but it's some of the most powerful data you're going to, you're going to see when you're, when you're doing research on it. And then if you can't afford it, um, there are a bunch of people you can pay that do market research on a daily basis. Uh, I, again, I'm from the tech world, so I love Gartner, a uh, huge fan of Gartner's. Um, I uh, have always paid for Gartner. It's expensive uh, for a startup. You know, I think it starts around 40 K. Um, but I tell you what, it's worth the 40 K um, by far. Um, you know, there's probably university pricing as well. Um, but there's a lot of these folks out there. I know your university uh, buys two. They buy Mintel and Ibis World. Uh, I've tried both of them. They're okay. Um, you should use them and make your own, um, you know, uh, figure out whether or not they work for you. Uh, once you become really serious about the startup world, um, you'll see that universities like MIT and the University of Connecticut really go deep on on you know being able to provide some of these um, some of these uh, tools as well, and um, and then there's a bunch of free stuff out there. You'll see that you know 
a lot of these folks put this research that you pay thousands of dollars for, they'll give you 10% of it or 20% of it as a sales tool. And they put it in the press releases. Um, they, you know, some people give it away. Um, you know, if you fill in a form, um, some people like, you know, give you away, give away everything like Deloitte likes to do. They'll give you a 50 page report that they wrote um, just because they want to know, they want you to know that they're viable. Um, and a Google patent search is a great place to go to um, when you're researching. And um, one that I love is uh, uh, the National um, Library of Medicine. I, you know, I'm a big um, DNA uh, biology kind of guy and I, I love that. And then the last piece of it is really the blue ocean approach. You have to do the strategy campus. Um, that's a, a must. Uh, and then, you know, one of the things I'm going to leave you with here, and I said it twice before, is this is continual. You have to do this, um, you know, start to finish. Market research is a daily thing. It's building the product, like I said, is 20% of it. 80% um, of building a successful company is everything else. And market research kind of binds all that together. Um, and there's, you know, many ways to do this. The most important thing, though, is build it into the product. Again, I can't state that enough. Building, like Uber did, a way to gain market research out of your product as well. You should be thinking of that before you ever launch a product into the market. Um, here's some good reads. I added several to it. I added some podcasts that I've been listening to lately. I can't say I, I think they're great, um, but I put them out here. Um, I love this Malcolm Gladwell, Failures of Market Research, um, TED.com um, uh, presentation. It's like 20 minutes, but it's well worth uh, listening to it um, as well. So I, I recommend you do it. And then I will put a caution out there. Um, you know, if you've read the book, The Innovator's Dilemma, you'll realize that if you listen to customers too much, um, and Malcolm Gladwell said this in the TED Talk as well, uh, it might send you off in the wrong direction. Uh, so you want to understand where the limitations are as well. So there are gates you need to put on on this. And uh, last but not least, um, there's a slide that uh, will show you some U.S. government trend data sets, World Bank, United Nations. U.S. government hopefully will get back to providing data um, that's better than what they've kind of shut down over the last four years. But We'll see where that goes. Um, LinkedIn does a bunch of good marketing trend reports. Uh, Indeed does as well. They have this great COVID-19 job trends report that shows you a lot about what's going on in the market of tech today. Um, the one that I love is Mary Meeker's reports. Um, I go through, these are like 300 pages long. She does them once a year. These are the best reports you can come by. Uh, she now runs Bond Capital, but um, she goes through in gory detail everything you never wanted to know about um, what's going on in tech at a very deep, um, you know, just a very minute level. And it, it's, um, it'll keep you uh, uh, up at night, some of the things that she'll show you. And it's worldwide. And, uh, and so this internet trends is probably one of the best things uh, out there. So uh, feel free to reach out to me at Proof Ventures. Uh, you know, this is just a little company that I have for my angel investments. Um, you can get me on LinkedIn. A lot of people did that the last time. I'll feel free to give you any advice that you want there. Uh, I would suggest using Givitas, uh, the new UM Ventures site, um, where we can give you some thorough feedback. And, and if you're interested in some of this stuff, you know, I've got it on my blog as well. And here's the, the link to the old presentation that I did uh, that's a copy of this. And, and I'm sure this one will be eventually made available. Um, as well. So, uh, Wendy, I've, I've left five minutes here, um, and uh, I'm going to uh, let you say a few words, um, and I'm going to look at your Q&A here. Sure. Thank you, Scott. Your presentation was awesome. There are so many great links for research. I really appreciate you sharing. I hope everyone do as well. Uh, presently, I would like to share a poll and would ask if you all can um, Provide feedback. Feedback is always great for us to be able to improve our webinar. So it's up presently. Wow. If anyone has any questions, feel free to type them in in the Q&A and Scott will be more than happy to respond. Yeah, I, I don't see any questions in there right now. So I uh, am, am I missing it or? 
Um, there isn't any in the Q&A, but Amanda okay. had asked if you could provide a link for her for the qualitative analysis in the chat. Um, yes, yes, I will. Thank you. Uh, actually, um, can you hit me up on LinkedIn and um, I'll send it to you there because I need to go find it. <laughs> it might take me a little while. Or hit me up on email and I'll send it and I'll copy you, Wendy, on it as well. Sure, thanks. Again, if anyone have any questions, feel free to type them in in the Q&A. If you're uncomfortable, you can raise your hand and I will unmute you and you will be able to ask your question if you like. I see there is a few um, people participating in the poll presently, so I want to thank you all for doing that in the meantime. I see one. Um... One comment just came in, uh, Wendy, about um, recording this and if it's going to be available. So our recording will be on our YouTube channel and you're more than welcome to look at it there. I can provide you with the link so you can go on there. Or you can send me an email at when at umb.edu and I'm more than happy to share it with you there as well. All right, look at that. We have three minutes left. We did a good job. Yeah. Good deal. I guess you provided thorough information, Scott. Everyone's gained a lot of knowledge. There isn't anything you missed or they understood everything. So great. Excellent. Um, All right. Well, thank you for inviting me, Wendy. My and pleasure. So at this time, since no one has any questions, I would like to thank Scott again for presenting. It was really some great information that you presented, a lot of links, a lot of research, and I'd like to thank you again. Um, anyone have questions, feel free to reach out to him um, since he has different means of um, communication. Again, thank you all, and have a great evening. See you.